my first thought went to like this baby not me I just yeah my reaction was autopilot like gotta take care of this baby and then go from oh, there I bet it was Hello and welcome to the Jean Hales podcast. I'm your host, Shelley Ware. It's safe to say the pandemic hasn't made life easy for any of us, but for our next guest, the past few years have been particularly brutal. In 2020, Anna Nunn was pregnant with her second child when she was diagnosed with cancer. Living on a remote cattle station, hundreds of k's from the nearest hospital, Anna had to overcome a series of obstacles to simply survive. I hope you enjoy this humbling interview with one of our inspiring Women's Health Week champions, Anna Nunn. Anna, you live on Waltana Station, which is like 600 kilometres north of Adelaide, very remote, beautiful part of the world. How close is the nearest town? We have a small town about 130 kilometres away from us, which is a pub and a service station and a small supermarket, but the biggest regional town to us is Port Augusta or Broken Hill in New South Wales. Now, I spent a lot of time in Port Augusta as a child, so I can see exactly where you are. It's a beautiful part of the world to live. When you do live remotely, what happens if you need to go to the doctor? So our doctor out here is the Royal Flying Doctors. So we have 24-hour access to a doctor through phone call, Zoom or picture messages, all those sorts of things, just whatever the consultation takes. And then once a month they do what we call a bush run, um, which is remote clinics. So they fly in generally to a station, but in our area we actually have a national park next door which has sealed strips, which is about 15 k's away from the homestead, and we can access that. So there's usually a doctor, a midwife or a nurse, and then every month there's mental health nurses or there's chronic illness. It rotates through who comes on the clinic. Oh, that's good. So you have quite good access to healthcare out there and also they've come up with lots of different plans to make sure that you and your family are healthy and safe. But let's go to 2020 and it's we're in the pandemic. You're pregnant with your second child and you woke up with an earache, I believe. And at that point, what did you think was wrong? I've had ear infections in the past and I just made a passing comment to my mother who was up at that stage and I just said, yeah, I thought I was beginning to get an ear infection. just had a sort of dull ache in my ear and just a little lump, which I thought was a um, swollen lymph node due to an infection. And just happened to be the prenatal clinic. They were coming in for their bush run and I was booked in for a prenatal clinic with a midwife and I just thought, by well, the doctor's there, we'll get it looked at. And when you actually went to have it looked at, they discovered it was cancer. How long did it take from that morning with the earache for your doctors to work out exactly what was going on? It was about 16 weeks. It was, yeah, just had thought to have been the start of an ear infection, and which didn't go away. Sort of came and went and the lump grew and then I uh, had another appointment and it was decided that they'd do a biopsy on the lump just because it, it was obviously growing and hadn't gone away. But sort of putting it down to one of those weird pregnancy things that happens or your body's immune system's down a bit while you're pregnant. But, yeah, it turned out that it was actually a, a malignant cancer. And how pregnant were you by that stage? I was early 30 weeks, so my actual diagnosis came at 34 weeks. But, yeah, there was a fair bit of toing and froing between 31 and 34 weeks when they really began investigating the lump. It must have been a pretty scary moment for you. What was it like when you actually found out that you had cancer? What went through your mind? So I had been waiting for two days for a phone call. I had been booked in for a consult. With the doctors in Adelaide as I was in Port Augusta at the time at our house there and the phone call hadn't come and I had done everything I could to distract myself. The RFDS had been making phone calls and I'd been making phone calls like, is there results in yet? And we just kept getting a bit of a bum steer saying, you know, there's nothing yet, they'll give you a call. And I remember saying to my son, who's not the greatest eater, and I'd said to him, if you eat all your tea tonight, we'll go to Macca's and we'll get a ice cream. And I cooked beef schnitzels and veg. It's a meal I remember because I never ate it. (laughs) And, yeah, he'd sat down to eat and I was just about to start eating and an unknown caller popped up on my phone and my, yeah, stomach dropped. I just sort of knew that it had to have been them calling and it was sort of, I don't know, a bit after six by this stage. And I, yeah, answered the call and it was a doctor from the Royal Adelaide Hospital 
And she said, I'm really sorry that I have to tell you this over the phone. And I immediately knew that it was going to be really bad news. Um, And she said, I'm really sorry, but you've got cancer. And the rest of the phone call was just a blur. Like I don't really remember. I didn't remember what she told me about what sort of cancer I had or anything. And she just said they needed to have more meetings or stuff that needed to be discussed, given the fact that I was such a high risk case and obviously a high risk pregnancy now, and that they would give me a call tomorrow. And that was sort of where it left me standing in the kitchen, the kitchen bench. Yeah, just gobsmacked. Was your partner there with you? No. So he was four hours away on the station at that stage. So I had to tell him over the phone also, along with my family, because my family will live about eight hours away from Port Augusta. So it was some really, really hard phone calls that I needed to make. But I sort of in that moment decided that I was going to be in charge of the narrative. Yeah, I wanted people to know. And I wanted it to come from me. I don't know how the Bush Telegraph works. And, yeah, I, I wanted to be the one to tell people. I imagine they really appreciated that as well because that, that can often be something for people who are hearing news about a loved one, that when it does come from someone, that strength that you showed um, to, to control your own narrative, that's really quite admirable, you know, being alone there with your, your beautiful son by your side in that moment. So, yeah, that's very admirable. And we did go and get ice cream. <laughs> oh, you're a beautiful mum. <laughs> ice cream is very important when you're down. And I had made the phone calls and my um, sister-in-law happened to be living on the street over from where we were, so she came over and, yeah, I just said, let's go get ice cream. I don't know how oh. other people how other people deal with their news, but, yeah, we went and got McFlurries. <laughs> but, yeah, it was pretty devastating to find out. I wasn't concerned for me, but my first thought went to, like, this baby yeah. that I'm growing like you know is there any damage to this child and my three-year-old child at the time as well not me I just yeah my reaction was autopilot like got to take care of this baby and then go from mm. there I bet it was I bet yeah I can only imagine that that's exactly what you were thinking about so what did the doctors talk about did you have your baby first and then look after your cancer yeah so there was a fair bit of toing and froing and three hospitals working very well together to manage the situation. So I went from the initial diagnosis and then the next day the obstetricians wanting me to have the baby, which was pretty scary because I was still in Port Augusta and had to have the baby in Adelaide. So I was still a long way from home and there's a lot of juggling, but they sat down and had more meetings and they were a bit worried that obviously what would happen after the surgery. So they decided that they'd let me go until 37 weeks so that we didn't have to juggle neonatal care with family they all worked together really well to manage it so I had my baby at 37 weeks um she was perfect and I was out of hospital within 24 hours and her birth was just so calm and we just walked into the room and had the baby and she came out screaming and our first baby we didn't hear sort of cry for the first six months of his life and he came out screaming and my husband and I sort of looked at each other like oh no (laughs) what have we got ourselves in for but she um yeah just became the most placid little baby so yeah it was very it was needed everyone in the room knew what was going on so they were very understanding oh beautiful and I went into hospital 10 days later to have the surgery on my tumor and have all my lymph nodes on my right side removed So were you able to go home in between having your beautiful baby girl or did you have to wait in Adelaide? So we waited in Adelaide. So I moved down to Adelaide on the 28th of January. Um, I had my surgery on the 11th of February. So we were in Adelaide for that time um, and stayed on for another four months after that. And that leads me to wondering about your recovery. What was that like? Were you able to be with your family or did you have to be in hospital? And Was there treatment after that? There's so many questions, Anna. (laughs) I had my operation and I was out on day four probably should have stayed longer but I was so desperate because I couldn't have my baby and the visits were very short due to COVID they did try to be accommodating and they were going to let the baby stay and Victoria went into lockdown and that sent South Australia into a snowball of do we have any cases and it was yeah eight o'clock one night my husband was going to bring the baby in so I could have her overnight and a nurse came in and said I'm sorry but there's no visitors as of now which is really hard and that just made me want to get out of hospital as quickly as I could 
so yeah, they let me out and I went back to the place we we're staying and I got back into trying to recover from this surgery and do the newborn mother managing bits and pieces. Um, I was very lucky that my parents were staying with us and I had to wait for more biopsy results to come through to see exactly what sort of cancer I had and what treatment I'd need. And it was decided that I would do six weeks of daily radiotherapy. But thankfully, you can start radiotherapy within six weeks of your operation, just so that hopefully nothing grows in that time or doesn't give anything any time to grow. So it was, yeah, about two weeks after they told me this and they said, given the fact that you've recovering from surgery, you're recovering from C-section, you've got a new baby, we'll give you another three and a half weeks. And then we'll be giving treatment just to give your body a bit more time to try and recover because obviously radiotherapy is going to be pretty tough. That's a whole roller coaster, Anna. How's your recovery going now? Where are you at now with all of this? After about 12 months, I was in remission. There's no sign of anything at the moment, but I'm still going back every three months for checkups and scans and tests and whatnot. And how are those beautiful children of yours? Getting very big. I now have a 17 month old little girl and an almost five-year-old boy it seems like so much time has passed I've done so much growing they they look back at a tiny little baby and a little three-year-old and yeah a lot's changed in that time. Mm, I think your story really brings home how important it is to get those health checks it's something that can be so easy to put off especially considering where you live and I know for me I live in Melbourne and I've just got a clinic down the road from my house but I could still be pretty guilty of not going and getting checked. So well done to you. Now, last question, Anna, and this is something we've been asking all our Women's Health Week champions. If you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Get to know your body. Get to know your freckles and your moles and every part of you so that if something does change, you notice. Well, thank you so much, Anna. That was wonderful. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for having me on. Anna's story is extraordinary and it captures one of the important messages that we champion here at Jean Hales. That is to listen to your body. When something doesn't feel right, please seek help. For more information about Jean Hales or Women's Health Week, visit jeanhales.org.au and we'll catch you next time.